I have heard that many of you would like to ask questions and have discussion meetings. If you would give your consent, tomorrow morning and day after tomorrow, these two meetings could be devoted to discussions. I would like to continue with the subject that we had taken up yesterday and if the two discussion meetings are not sufficient then we might sit up in the evenings. I generally do not conduct two meetings in a day because I travel all the year round and the meetings, the talks, the discussions are things that continue every day, you know, this is not only for a week. So one has to work throughout the year and giving a talk or having a discussion meeting is not an intellectual or a theoretical or a speculative game for me. It's something like life blood that is shared with the listeners. So we will have discussion meetings tomorrow and day after. If necessary, then we will spend time in the evening. We were talking yesterday about learning how to observe. If there is any conscious effort, if there is any conscious step to be taken, this is the first and the last, to learn how to observe. That is to say, to learn to keep the brain steady and alert but not active and this is the issue we might go into this morning rather elaborately. <coughs> we had seen yesterday that to observe is to be attentive without reacting, it's a non-reactional attention. Observation is a non-reactional attention. You look at something, you are aware of the nature of what that is, what is being observed and yet you do not react intellectually, that is to say you do not compare or evaluate it you do not interpret or analyze it, you just are with it. Your cognition power is intact. When you look at it, you are aware of what it is, not that you are sleeping. And yet, your likes and dislikes and opinions and theories do not interfere with the act of observation. And this is something we do not know. We have been educated to look at people with motives, to have relationships with calculations, to look at other people's eyes and to guess their reactions towards us and manipulate our behavior in such a way that we can have recognition or appreciation from them. From them. So we do not know how to look innocently, very intensely, very alertly, but to look innocently in the sense that intellectual calculation and judgment doesn't come in. So one sits down and watches. The consciousness that we have works on two planes the surface or the conscious plane which contains the knowledge that you have acquired since childhood, the impressions that you have absorbed unconsciously 
since childhood, things that you have assimilated consciously and with effort. So, acquired knowledge, absorbed impressions and assimilated ideas, theories, conclusions, ideologies, <laughs> all these are on the surface level of the mind, on the surface plane of the mind. The experiences that you have gone through, experiences that have been inevitable, experiences that you have sought for, you have hunted for them, experiences that you have cultivated. <coughs> so all this is on the surface level. Now, according to the knowledge and experience of this life that you have gone through since childhood, you try to take a step in relationship. Your relationship with things, with individuals, with new thoughts and ideas, new situations, challenges, whenever you move into a relationship, first the energy contained on the surface level moves and you feel now I am looking at a challenge. I am going to meet a person according to my ideas, my opinions, my preferences or prejudices. But do see please that when you move on the conscious level into a relationship, it is not only the conscious level that operates. But as soon as the conscious level begins to operate, that which is deeper in the subconscious or unconscious moves with it. You may feel that you are moving into a relationship according to your knowledge, your ideology, but it is the total consciousness that moves. Slightest movement on the surface level causes a movement in the deeper layers of the mind, the deeper levels of the mind, which the occidental psychology has called the subconscious or the unconscious. Now, the energy on the conscious level has a velocity, has a momentum. And the energy contained in the subconscious and unconscious has a separate momentum Velocity independent of you, independent of your conscious level. The subconscious and the unconscious have a momentum, have a movement. So when the conscious moves, the deeper layers move and they move much quicker than the conscious level. So the tendencies, the passions, the frustrations, the cynicism, the bitterness, the ambitions, the greed, the jealousy, the violence contained in the subconscious or the unconscious, inherited from parents, inherited from society, inherited from your race and the total humanity, they move much quicker than your conscious thought, purpose, motive, intention. The direction given to your movement by your conscious mind is sometimes shattered completely by the momentum of the unconscious and subconscious that overwhelms the conscious. The conscious moves slowly in comparison to the unconscious. There are two momentums going on. And this is not something very difficult that I am telling you. You turn to all the idealists in the world in the so-called democratic world or the so-called socialist world. There is no dearth of good ideas and ideals. They want to create a society based on equality, fraternity. And in the socialist world they want to have a society, classless society, society where there will be no exploitation, injustice where the state boundaries will be wiped off completely, where the proletarian of the world will unite. We see it in Russia, 
in Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Cuba, Romania, China, many countries, perhaps half the population of the world. Consciously, they had taken up these ideas and fed them into the conscious level of the mind. But in the unconscious was the violence. The relationship to money and ownership is deeply rooted in the unconscious. The lust for power, the lust for domination. So all that overwhelmed what was constructed nicely, beautifully on the conscious level. The ideas, the thoughts, they have been thrown to winds in the race for power. You may start from uh, looking at this phenomenon in Russia from 1905 onwards, Mensheviks and Bolsheviks and the whole Bolshevik revolution and the race for power and the conditions of the party right from the murder of Trotsky up to this date. You can look at it. It is the unconscious that overwhelms the conscious. The direction decided and determined by the conscious is thwarted and the human being individually and collectively goes into a completely different direction. We speak of democracy, we speak of peace, we speak of unity and the unconscious powers come up and the national policies are based not upon the intention for peace, but they are dominated by the instinct for power, superiority, the desire to dominate over others militarily, politically, ideologically, religiously and so on. So please do see what we call the conditioned area of psyche is a vast area the unconscious and the subconscious. You cannot play around with it lightly and say, I will, I will crush it, the whole conditioning. I will wish it away. It is there. So now, if we see this clearly as a fact, we will see the danger in moving the conscious mind and hoping at the same time that the unconscious and subconscious shall not move. So if you try to make a conscious effort, if you try to concentrate, focus your attention exclusively upon an object, be it a candle flame, be it a picture, be it a cross, be it some idol, picture of someone living or dead. If you try to concentrate, you make an effort. Making an effort is resisting distraction. So you make an effort, you use the conscious level. And when you are using the conscious level, naturally the subconscious and unconscious do move. Then they stimulate experiences gone through by the ancestors. The knowledge they experience is stimulated and you enter into visions and experiences unrelated to your personal life. So the effort at concentration, though gives an appearance of a quiet mind, it is stimulating at the deeper layers, experiences of the human race and projecting them upwards. If you exercise the mind in chanting a mantra, You use the sound energy, the sound vibrations. You are making an effort. The conscious movement of chanting a mantra, repeating it, sets into motion the deeper layers. And they have their own logic. They have their own way of function. It de doesn't depend upon you or me. It's the total human race, condensed as it were, in the psyche. And it's a tremendous force. When it gets projected, it can shatter the nerves of the person. 
it can throw the person into such experiences and such visions and such events for which his nerves are not ready, which are not prepared. They haven't got the strength even to bear the encounter with such an event. So, as soon as you use and exercise the conscious mind to repeat a mantra, to concentrate, to do worship, for any activity whatsoever, instead of the whole consciousness, the vast area of conditioned psyche, becoming quiet, you stimulate it, you provoke it. That is why one has to learn how to observe. In observation, the conscious mind doesn't have to move from an idea or a thought to another thought. It doesn't have to compare, to evaluate, to judge. It doesn't have to enter into a like or dislike. It is only a steady flame of attention. When it wants to compare or judge, then it has to fall back upon the unconscious or the subconscious. But observation, the state of observation, wakes up a steady flame of attention, the connection of which with the past gets snapped completely. I hope you will listen to these words not entering into, not trying to agree or disagree. If you can just receive what is being said this morning, I know the mind will be very quick to react, emotional. What of this? What of that? Though all those questions can be taken up later on. But as a friend, I wish to communicate that there is a non-reactional way of attention where the brain is alert and steady but not active. In the state of observation, the past, the conditioned area of psyche has no role to play because you don't want to analyze what you are observing. You don't want to interpret it. You don't want to accept it. You don't want to reject it. You don't want to do anything with what is being observed. The past, the knowledge, the experience, the inheritance have a role to play and interfere or intervene the moment I want to do something with the object of my perception, with the object of my audition, then the whole past gets into motion. But when you learn to observe the conditionings with their tremendous momentum have no role to play. Because the I, the me, is not getting into a relationship with what is being observed. The past has a role to play when the me, the self, the ego, wants to get into a relationship with what is being perceived, what is being looked at, what is being observed. And for that relationship, the knowledge, the experience since childhood, and the knowledge, the experience inherited of the whole human race, they jump over and they color the perception and they regulate and control your reaction or response. So in the state of observation, the momentum of the past has no role to play. It goes into abeyance. You don't have to force it into stillness. You don't have to push it down. You don't have to exercise any force, any violence against the past. You know, if in the name of religion or a spiritual inquiry, you exercise violence against yourself, against your inner being or against your physical body, the scars and the scratches of that violence accompany you to the state of freedom. Then the expression of the freedom the expression of liberation or nirvana or satori or what you will gets damaged by the scars and scratches on the psyche. 
the expression gets damaged. It doesn't have the wholeness, the homogeneity, the richness of being undamaged, having no scar at all. So, we are, we are talking about learning to observe, that is, to be in the state of attention where knowledge and experience of this life or the inherited has no role whatsoever. So the past it goes into abeyance. With the tremendous momentum that it had, it goes into abeyance. It is not destroyed. It is not damaged. It is not mutilated. What's the use of mutilating the mind? This complex mind and the contents of this human mind are so beautiful. The human race has put into developing the languages, the symbols, the cultures, the ways of behavior. They have put into all that tremendous energy, time, their lifeblood. So what's the use of mutilating, crushing, denying or fighting against the past? You cannot fight against the earth if you want to walk upon it. So the conditionings that are intrinsic and organic part of the psych psychological structure, the mind, the brain, it's very childish to think of fighting against it, trying to conquer it, trying to defeat it. That language is very juvenile. So in the state of observation, the past has no role to play. The inheritance. Even your own knowledge, so stripped off the tremendous momentum of the past, there flickers a flame, a flame of attention. So the brain is steady, alert and sensitive, sharp. Steadiness sharpens the brain, you know. So on one hand, the perception is purified. Through observation, the perception is purified, no more polluted by the subjective reaction. It's a non-subjective perception. I wish I could put into words the beauty of that state. And on the other hand, the contents of the whole mind, the whole conditioned mind, they unwind themselves <coughs> unto your attention. The seeing, the observing has become now simple and pure. And the contents of the mind are unwinding themselves before that attention. We have seen yesterday that observation is a mental activity. You are still dividing your energy into the observer and the observed. As you sit before a mirror, you look at yourself, your own reflection into the mirror. There are no two persons, but you still are looking at something. You don't look at nothing in the mirror. When you sit before it, you look at something. Your shape, your body, the various limbs, the beauty of it, the ugliness of it, the shortness, the length. You know, you, you are looking at yourself. So, in the state of observation, you are looking at your own mind, the contents of the whole mind. They get exposed. Such observation is felt very difficult because we have our own images. Our whole life is spent in manufacturing images and projecting them in relationships. I present and project one, one image to my husband, another to my son, 
third to my mother, fourth to my friend. I have nice collection of images. You see, we go on making images and gathering them and projecting those images, unrelated to one another. Even among friends, I project one image to one friend and another image to another friend. So if the two friends come together and they are together with me, then I find myself in a difficulty, suppressing one, showing off another, hiding one. The whole game goes on. So we have these images of ourselves. That I am a cultured person, I am a very gentle person, I have no pettiness, or I am an idealist. And in, and in observation, the pettiness, the angularities, the peculiarities, the shallowness, the selfishness, all that was ignored or brushed aside comes to the forefront. Before the searchlight of that pure non-reactional attention, your whole inner being gets exposed and it is very painful because the image is shattered and the reality is before me. So as soon as one sees it, one says, goodness me, I am like this, so much violence in me, oh poor me, this violence must be due to my mother, to my father or to my teacher. Then I bring to my help various theories of psychology, psychoanalysis and try to throw the responsibility upon someone else. If the enquiry is not genuine, then in the state of observation the ego feels hurt, humiliated, enters into self-pity or gets excited if he comes across a good point and feels a superiority over others. So the state of observation does not persist. It is not observation that is difficult, but we are so used to having our own images, projecting them, and on the fact when you are left with yourself, the naked fact of your being, there is nothing to project. And then you say, I am frightened. Because you can't do anything with the fact. With other people you can play around. With the facts, you are left alone with them. In the sanctity of solitude, you are left with the nakedness of your own being. The inner being. And one wants to cover it up. One wants to push it away. Don't you see how we want to hide our own weaknesses from our own intelligence. We are always in a hurry. If the intelligence points out a mistake, we are in a hurry to brush that aside so that the intelligence doesn't see it. Not from others, but even from our own intelligence and sensitivity, we try to cover the mistakes of commission, omission, indifference, callousness, Observation will not be difficult if we are not trying to justify ourselves, the weaknesses that we come across. If we do not try to explain them, justify them, defend them. If we have the humility to be with what is, as it is, to look at it squarely in face. As you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't Throw a stone at the mirror if the mirror shows your ugliness. You don't crack it. So the state of observation is like a mirror into which the inner being is exposed. Not only when you sit down in a room and are observing, but once you have learned to observe, the inner being is exposed while you are moving in relationship. When you work in the office, with your colleagues, react to the boss and his behavior. When you are at home with the wife or the girlfriend, the boyfriend, the husband, the children, or you are with yourself, the state of observation becomes a new dimension of your consciousness. Not the experiencer and the doer, but the observer. Still in the realm of consciousness, still in the realm of thought, 
still in the realm of mind, but yet it's a new way altogether. So you are aware of your own reaction. You are the observer, though you are moving in and through relationships. When the contents of the unconscious and subconscious, when the contents of the conditioned mind are thus exposed and observed with humility, without self-pity, without inhibition of defending or justifying, when there is no more to observe, then only the observer along with the observed goes into abeyance. As the past had gone into, gone into abeyance, this activity of observing, dividing oneself into the observer and the observed, is over when there is nothing more to be observed. Till then the observer persists. Till then there is no silence. So it is a mental activity. There is division, but there is no sting in that division. It is a mental activity without a sting. When you are experiencing, that activity adds to the burden of the memory. When you are interpreting, analyzing, you are adding to the burden of the memory. But when you are observing, nothing gets reduced to memory. There is no segment or residue left behind. So it is a mental activity which does not produce something to be transferred to memory. I wonder if I can make it sufficiently clear. Observation is an activity which does not produce a new chain of activity, a new chain of reaction does not leave any residue behind. You observe, you see, you understand and there is an end of it. There is an end to it. In experiencing there is no end to it. Well, when the observer and the observed go into abeyance, after the conditioned part has been exposed, then only silence begins. We can now come to the word silence. Up till now, we were quiet, physically quiet, the brain was quiet, there was a kind of peacefulness, but there was no silence because the observer was still observing. There was a movement in the consciousness. There was a movement in the individual psyche. But when the observer has gone into abeyance, when there is no more division in the consciousness as the observed and the observer, it is one whole now. There is no movement in it. The whole individual consciousness or psyche in its totality is quiet. You know, silence is the mind being quiet in its totality. Not only the conscious or the subconscious, but the whole of it. So the energy that, that was moving through the mind, the energy that was moving through the consciousness, the conditioned energy, that conditioned energy doesn't move now. In the, in the realm of silence, the conditioned energy does not move. As now we are sitting together in this room, the, the feet that can wander around the globe, that can run, that can climb the mountains, have gathered all the motion contained in themselves, and they are sitting quietly. In the same way, in silence, the conditioned energy of the brain, the cerebral organ, is gathered unto itself and is quiet, has gone into abeyance. When the conditioned energy goes into abeyance, the unconditioned energy 
comes into play. I hope you remember that we began the first day with the visible, the tangible, the physical structure. It has its energy. The physical body has its energy, the muscular energy, the glandular energy, the nervous energy. We went to the very subtle part of the physical structure, the brain. The cerebral organ has its energy. As the physical has been conditioned, trained, modulated, regulated, the cerebral has been conditioned by thoughts, by ideas, by values, by ideologies. So we were in the realm of conditioned energy. We may play around in the realm of conditioned energy, permutation and combination, we can give new expressions to our ways of behavior, physical and psychological, yet it is all the area of conditioned energy. Now in silence, the whole conditioned area is quiet, in abeyance. So the unconditioned energy of intelligence steps in. When the cerebral organ was moving, it was the intellect cultivated, sophisticated by the human race that was in operation, that was function. Now the energy of the intellect, the thought, the idea, the word, the sound, the meaning, the associations, all that is in abeyance and unconditioned energy of intelligence comes into play. And I'm sure every one of us has seen some time or other in life how intelligence operates. Intelligence is the sensitivity permeating your whole being. Intelligence is the nature of life. It permeates your whole being. When you function through the brain, it functioned from a center. Located in the head, it had a center. It had a center in the idea of me, the ego, the self. So it was a movement from the center towards its frontiers, towards its periphery. Now the center along with its periphery is quiet. Please do see. So the new movement is not from one part of the body, it is not from the head, it is not from the center of the me, because intelligence does not belong to you or me. It is a, it is a non-personal, non-conditioned, non-individualized energy. We are dealing with something very serious, whole life is a complex phenomenon with various currents of energy right from the mineral to the human life all the planets and the suns and the moons it's a play cosmic dance of energy various levels various kinds and we have seen the energy that has been conditioned by man in his own being we are now through silence in the realm of energy that is not individualized, not personalized, not conditioned in any way. It is just the sensitivity. You know, you can't condition beauty, love, innocency, humility. Thought has been conditioned. Silence is not conditioned. Attachment, attraction, infatuation, all these are conditioned ways of behavior. Love is not conditioned. Tenderness is not conditioned. Rigidity, dogmatism has been conditioned and given, given expressions, forms of expression, channels of expression. So now we are in the realm of energy that, is, that does not belong to you or me, but it flows through us as it flows through every blade of grass, through the rays of the sun, through the crystal clear drops of water. It's a non-personalized energy, intelligence, permeating your whole being. So instead of a fragmentary movement, there is a total movement.
and as the intellect knows or acquires an information or idea about a fact, intelligence, when it moves, it is only aware. In the realm of intellect, there is knowledge, there is experiencing. In the realm of intelligence, there is only awareness. The movement of intelligence is called awareness. It is a movement from the totality of a person in communion with the totality outside him. It's like a wave, a tide, coming in and going out. Intelligence flows in you and out of you. The separation, the isolation, the fragmentation or division that man had created in his ignorance from the rest of life around him is over. That division is not there in silence. You are now organically with the life around you. There is nothing mysterious about it, but we have not looked at it. So if a person begins to talk, we feel as if something mysterious is being taught. These are simple facts of life at a very deep level of living. So, in the realm of silence, now there is a new movement of a new energy. Movement of intelligence and the energy, the movement of awareness and energy of intelligence, not the energy of thought. The energy of thought always moves through friction of division and the intelligence moves in its wholeness without division, without separation. But still it is a movement. Still there is motion, there is energy. And as long as there is a movement and as long as there is energy, we are still in the realm of matter. Awareness, the state of awareness is not the state of meditation. In the state of meditation there is no movement whatsoever. But in silence there is a movement not of the individual psyche but of an unconditioned non-personal energy. It's a new energy, tremendous velocity, much more than the velocity of thought. The energy of thought has been measured, the forms of thought, the colors of thought. It has been measured, but the energy of love or humility or silence has not been measured. There are no measurements for that yet. So, the intelligence moves and makes you aware of the totality around you or the totality within you. It is a movement of your whole being in communion with the wholeness around you. So at your disposal then, at the disposal of such a person living in silence, are the resources of the whole universe. The intelligence that surrounds him flows in. It keeps the person very fresh. His whole perception becomes not an individual or collective perception, but a universal or multiversal perception. His responses are in relation to the whole cosmos. The perception, the quality of perception born of non-duality is indescribable, at least for me. I don't know the words into which I could pour the quality of that perception. Because when the intelligence perceives, it does not say I and the Tao, the me and the not me. There is no division. The perception on the mental plane is born of duality. But the perception that occurs, that takes place on the level of intelligence 
is born of non-duality. It has a different quality altogether. And therefore, the response has the breath of spontaneity. The perception has the perfume of wholeness and the response has the breath and vitality of spontaneity. If a person does not try to cling to this movement of infinite intelligence through him, if a person does not try to arrest it, to cling to it, to demonstrate it to people, to channelize it, then even this movement subsides of its own because there is no one to arrest it, to obstruct it, to identify himself with it. So this motion or this movement also subsides and a person is in the state of total motionlessness, no movement whatsoever of the individual or the universal, of the conditioned or the unconditioned energy. There is no motion at all. That is the state of meditation. Meditation is not an activity, mental or physical. It's not a psychic activity. Meditation is a state of being where you are, as life is, in your totality. As long as there is a movement, of attention, observation, experience, there is the duality, the observer and the observation, the experiencer and the experienced. As long as there is a movement, it is not a state of meditation. In meditation, Life only vibrates, vibrates where it is and as it is, not from one point to the other as the river flows from one point to the other. It is a, it is a horizontal and vertical movement together simultaneously. So life vibrates in meditation. I should not go into <coughs> any other issue because we had started with the mind yesterday. I thought let us, let us take it to its logical end as far as words can carry. You know, words can say so little. After having talked to you for an hour, I feel much remains unsaid. But we have been, we have been looking at our life. We are used to certain forms of energy, certain patterns of movement. From the conditioned to the unconditioned we go, but still there is a movement of awareness. And one would like to say that there is still a different way of living where there is no movement at all. One lives there in the isness of life. And out of that isness, out of that wholeness, whenever relationships are warranted, one moves into those relationships. Not out of friction, not out of division, but out, out of totality. Then the movement becomes an extension of the inner peace. Then speaking becomes an extension of the substance of silence that is within you then relationships become an extension of the state of relaxation in which you live. So there is no dichotomy, there is no conflict between the two. As you inhale and exhale breath, in the same way you move into relationships and come out of them. 
we have been talking about a way of living. We have been living on the intellectual plane, the mental, the psychological plane so long, thousands of years, and now the mind is worn out. Innumerable variety of ideologies and theories. Mind has tried honestly to grasp them, to acquire them, to store them into memory, to behave according to them. Mind has gone through such an effort resistance, inhibition, suppression, repression, acceptance, rejection, all the games the human mind has tried and yet there is no peace, no harmony, no relaxation. Man is tense, well fed, well clothed, surrounded by luxury and affluence and yet so pitiably poor inside him. If you visit the affluence stricken countries and the starvation stricken countries, the so-called religion-stricken countries, talking of theology and religion, obsessed with it, and countries that call themselves atheist, poor and rich, theist and atheist, idealist and pragmatist, visit any country, any people. If you are sensitive to the people and their expressions, you will see within very short time that individual, individually and collectively, man is not at peace in harmony. Relationships should be occasions for expressing the inner harmony. Instead of that, the moment of relationship and there is an inhibition, there is a withdrawal, then a calculation, then a projection, then an adjustment, a compromise. That's how we live. And this is surely not a way of living. To live is to be free, to move with the movement around you, harmoniously. So man gets born anew within himself, of himself and free from the hangover of animal instincts, free from the clutches of thought or the cerebral action. He moves with the help of unconditioned intelligence in relationship. And this is possible for every human being because I see it as the consummation of human growth, not the privilege of few. If we are interested and go through a self-education, and self-education means equipping the physical structure to cooperate with the inner movement of intelligence. How does one do it? We shall talk about it later on, perhaps after the question-answer sessions that you, are, you would like to have. We'll go into it on the last day. Thank you.